a second, it'll say that. There we go. Hello. I'm magic. Um, OK, so uh, first of all, thank you, Todd, for that wonderful introduction. Um, it was, of course, all true. I am an incredible person and a really nice person as well. And I have a company called Modest, or I did. Um, anyway, um, so uh, I, when I founded the company Modest, I told my partner, I was like, Hiromi, my company's called Modest. And she's like, what's wrong with you? Modest people don't call themselves Modest. And I was like, that's a good point. So anyway, I'm Harper. and. Um, Please follow me on Twitter. It's really the only reason I speak in public is just as my social media strategy. It's really slow. Um, but uh, I'd love to interact with you. So if there's any questions you have, please reach out. Um, OK, so today I'm going to talk about really one thing. Um, and that's just open source. How many people like open source? Yay! Actually, I'm kidding. I'm not going to talk about open source. Um, I'm actually going to talk about product design. Um, one of the things that I, I've been in open source for a very long time. I've used Linux for forever. Huge fan of open source, but I often find that it's not very usable. It's actually not very, it doesn't work very well if you don't, if you're not a nerd, if you're not kind of technical like many of us. And I want to talk about how we try and make really accessible products. And I think I would like to see this more in open source, so, so. Bear with me. But first, before I get into that, I'm going to talk about my favorite topic in the world, which I bet you can't guess, myself. Um, and so, yeah, I love, I, I love talking about myself, so this will be quick because I'm excited. Um, how many people know who this is? OK, good, good. A handful of you. How come not everyone knows? What's wrong? I thought this was a, was a tech crowd. Yeah, I'm sure a lot of people just aren't raising their hands. So obviously, this is Steve Wozniak and, uh, and Steve Jobs and some middle person. I'm not sure who that is. Um, but uh, this is my first computer, and uh, how many people had Apples? Good. How many had the subcomputers, Commodores? OK, I'm sorry. Um, anyone read this book? Great book, really good book. This book really got me invigorated on the idea of being a hacker. Um, this idea of sharing, openness, collaboration, all that fun stuff. Um, and I realized when I was really young that I'm a hacker. And then that kind of brought me to college, where I went to for school for computer science. And I'm, I'm, my background is I'm a coder. Um, I mean, over the last few years, I've basically been a bureaucrat. How many bureaucrats in the audience or middle management? OK, good, good. We got to stick together. Um, so uh, a, a little while back, I, I worked for a company called Threadless. Anyone know Threadless? I think we powered everyone's t-shirt in like 2004. It was a really bright time. This was, Threadless was really cool. And for those of you who don't know Threadless, one of the interesting things about Threadless is we kind of invented crowdsourcing. We had no idea what we were doing. Because for us, um, we'd, we'd gone to MIT. And uh, we were there kind of at a conference like this, much smaller. And they were like, oh, and here's Threadless. They invented crowdsourcing. And we were just like, crowd what? What are you talking about? Because for us, it was super simple. We were just trying to make that into that. This very easy thing of just making a t-shirt. And we, we, of course, used the crowd, but we didn't really know what we were doing. Um, and, and we had made a simple kind of application. It just had four steps. What it did is it took designs from people like y'all. Um, you, you would upload them, and then you'd score on them, and then cash money would fall into our pockets. This was perfect. This is a great business model for any of you who are looking for business models. Um, and this was wonderful. And I mean, this was a lot of fun. And we did none of the hard work. Um, you know, we were able to kind of focus on the important things. And I'd, I'd largely accompl accomplished all my goals in 2009. And so I did the one thing that I invite everyone here to do, which is quit your job. Who's with me? OK, good. We have a few people. Good, good, good. Um, we can all work together later on something, I suppose. Hopefully, none of your bosses are here with you. Um, but um, I went on a vision quest. And you all know what a vision quest is, yeah? OK, sort of. I see some shaking heads. So a vision quest is when you go into the desert and you do a lot of drugs. I did not do that. I joined a venture capital firm for a bit, which is basically the same thing <laughs> emotionally. Um, and so that was a lot of fun. Just spent some time learning about startups and whatnot. And then um, one thing led to another. And this company reached out to me, the Obama campaign. Kind of a surprise for me. Um, this guy, Michael Slaby, who's a good friend and one of the smartest people I know, who was also the CTO in 2008 of the Obama campaign, reached out and was just like, Harper, you know, what are you doing right now? And one thing led to another, and then I became the CTO of 2012. Um, but this is act my actual campaign photo. Now, just look at this for a second. <laughs> I always joke that the, uh, that the next, the 2016 person would be a homeless person. But they actually just hired really talented people instead, which I mean, homeless people, I suppose, are talented as well. But anyway, um, so the real question that you guys are probably answering is the same question my mom asked, which was, why you? 
Like, why, why did you do this? And, you know, after I was like, come on, mom, confidence. Like, the question, you, to answer that question, you got to go back to 2008 when the Obama campaign and many campaigns, much like now today, were startups. They had no idea if they were going to last three weeks or, or six weeks or a year, let alone whether they were going to last until the election. Um, whereas in 2012, we were basically the Microsoft of campaigns. We knew we were going to raise a billion dollars and do big software and all that stuff. And so, as you know, if you Google Microsoft, I show right up. Um, obviously not true. So they picked an engineer. And so this is the thing. They picked this engineer, myself, to kind of lead engineering. And we hired lots of lots of developers. Um, we hired one of my teams out of about 40 people um, from all of these kind of great companies. Obviously, that's the most important one. And then we had about 120 tech staff total. Um, the interesting thing about this number is about 10 times the tech staff we had in 2008. So it just grew by an order of magnitude, which is really exciting. And another order of magnitude down, we started from absolutely zero. Nothing. So when I stepped in, there was absolutely nothing, which was kind of fun. We had about 18 months. Um, and so we had to focus on really one thing and one thing only, which was execution. Um, oh, yeah. So this is a cake. Um, every time I, I put this slide up, I always surprise myself, even though, I mean, I was surprising when we got it. Someone just walked in, our DevOps guy, Scott, was like, hey, here's this cake I got you guys. And we were just like, uh, what if we can't eat this cake? Because... What if we lose, and then it's because we ate the cake? Because at this point, we're very superstitious. Um, but luckily, you know, we won, obviously, and so then we ate the cake, which was way sketchier. But the, th the thing about this is, is we built, to focus on execution, we really just, we just built this platform. And I think this happens a lot. How many people are building a platform? It's a really easy thing to do. For us, this platform was called Narwhal, which was a bad name. It's a really good name for us nerds. We like narwhals, and like Reddit likes narwhals, and people like narwhals. But then everyone's like, what's narwhal? And that, that's a bad code name. You want your code name to be like table. No, everyone knows what a table is. Super boring. Anyway, sorry. So, oh yeah, this is, uh, this is Jim Messina, my boss, dressed as a narwhal via Photoshop. Um, and then here he is as Harry Potter. This is him as a giraffe. This is my favorite one. I think this is one of the most awkward pictures I've ever seen in my life. Um, there he is as a dragon. So the campaign was super hard. It was really stressful. Um, and this is, you know, you know, you do those presentations and they're kind of contentious and you're a little bit worried about the results. Um, and so you're like, you know, you're in front of your bosses and you're, you're, you're worried they're going to yell. So that was kind of how this was. We tried to bring humor into the organization. One of the things we did is we had these as the questions, like the last slide that says questions. Um, and so it would always be like that guy saying questions. And, um, and the question was always, what's wrong with you? So it worked. Um, so anyway, we had this thing called Narwhal. It was this giant concept, really simple, that we'd have this giant API as the foundation for everything we were doing, and that would give us the freedom to focus on the products, which is one of the most important things that any of us can do. When we think about platform, oftentimes as technologists, we get excited about the platform part, the big P platform. But we forget that it's the things that are built on top of the platform that really power the platform. The big P doesn't matter if the products don't work. Um, and the products that we had were all these kind of fun products, big data stuff, some mobile apps. We raised a boatload of data and some social media, which I think is boring, except for Twitter followers. But anyway, so one of our biggest innovations was data, lots of data stuff. We use data for absolutely everything. The media, though, loves data. Here's a Google search. Okay, that's kind of boring. So it says, you know, there's just nothing there. So that's pretty boring. Let's add micro-targeting. Anyone here know what micro-targeting is? This is some fun stuff, micro-targeting. Let's just... Enhance. I have no idea what that means. But I think what it means, oh yeah, besides the fact this is the best picture on the internet, that's a, a horse holding a cat on a boat, those are, this is not a natural occurrence. You got to really look for that. But um, what this tells you is that micro-targeting is really exciting. Like nobody knows what this is, but it's really exciting. Here's some examples. So this is the first thing. The first thing is campaigns are always going to send you email. Always, forever. This is in 2008, early 2008, or mid-2008. This is just, it's going to happen. So just be ready for it coming 2016. Open your inboxes wide. Um, here's an actual email that I received, and here's the personalization point. That 56 bucks there, basically what we did is we looked at all my previous contributions, all my activity, and then we said, what is Harper, Harper going to give? We said 56 bucks, put that in email, and I just clicked it. Bam, 56 bucks. And we did that over and over again, and many people got those emails. We, did a, we put a Facebook button in front of it, and this was really exciting. Um, and actually, this is another email that I received, a real one. This is about North Carolina. Um, and actually, this is my best friend, John. We used a lot of math and analytics to
to be basically be able to tell who your best friends are. That's kind of weird. This is one of those things that we can talk about later about how not to be creepy. That's because when you're like, here's your best friend, and you're like, how did you know? But actually, it's really easy because here's the thing. There's all these people in our lives that we influence or influence us. And oftentimes on Facebook, you have, how many people have those friends on Facebook that you have no idea who they are, but they keep liking every status update? Or there's a lot of those, right? So you take those and you throw them out. And you have the people that are left over, the people that aren't, like that, that you're tagged with, that you're maybe, that you have photos of yourself with, that you're actually tagged in locations with. Those are the people that we can, looking at various um, algorithms and whatnot, we can kind of say, oh, I can ascertain that this is actually your friend. And there's obviously some false positives and whatnot, but we try to avoid those. And so then we merge social media with kind of email marketing and had this great thing here. Works super well. Um, we also did this with, with SMS, and SMS was really fun. Um, we did a lot of fun stuff. I thought this was how it was going to be because I was certain that it wasn't going to work very well. Um, but it actually worked super well, and uh, you know, on New Year's Eve, we did this big promotion, and this is how I'm sure it turned out. Um, but we had this really wonderful team. Um, they did all these emails and all this promotion stuff, and overall, we did about $640 million of contributions, which is just bananas. Um, and the president, who's pretty awesome, one time, the president, I'm going to say something that sounds kind of stupid, not like the rest of the stuff, but uh, um, <laughs> he, the president is very presidential. That's a silly thing to say, right? Everyone's like, well, yeah. But that, what that means is the president doesn't normally say, hey. The president's just not like, hey. Until you send an email that says, hey, that, the, well, that raised a whole bunch of money, then the president says, hey. That's the exciting thing, is you can use multivariate testing and all this fun analytics stuff to, to guide the brand and whatnot, which is some of the stuff we did. So data helped. It was very exciting, raised boatloads of dollars, better content distribution, all this good stuff. The most important one was obviously voter contact. Um, election day was pretty chilled out. I learned the definition of frenetic. Um, it was really fun. This is actually a picture from election day. I was like, that little dog. But um, obviously we won and that was, that was good. Um, so after that, I was kind of lost. I was like, what am I gonna do? And so I went on another vision quest and this one was modest. And we had a very simple goal here, which was in the last 15 years, me and some friends have basically spent all of that time building e-commerce tools. How many here, people here are in e-commerce in one way or the other? Okay, good. How many, keep your hands up. How many here work on mostly the back end of e-commerce? Okay, good. A few people's hands went down, but a lot of, some other people's hands went up, which is confusing. But, um, so what, what, that's basically our experience as well. We're, we're busy making, you know, the warehouse more efficient, making, you know, how do you make all these things more efficient, but we never touched the user-facing stuff. We never touched how the shopping cart worked. We never touched how the catalogs worked. We never touched all this stuff that we use every day. And so we decided, how do we focus on the user? How do we make sure that we're creating this really great experience? How do we make a better, you know, quicker, friendlier, and more mobile experience for commerce? And um, largely, we did that. It was good. And then we, we kind of solved it. And then all of a sudden, I found the greatest cheat code for scale of any startup, which is to sell to PayPal. So that's really a good way to get a lot of customers fast. Um, and I was joking with a friend that if I had a little bit more time, I could add more slides and tell you what's going to happen. But since that was just a month ago, I can't really tell you yet. Um, but in building Modest and building some of the stuff we built before, a lot of this came from these very simple rules, which I kind of want to talk to you all about. Because I think it's really important that we start thinking, how are we affecting the user with the open source we're, we're building? Um, and I have a lot of friends that, that maintain open source, and, and this is some of the stuff that we've talked through. So obviously, your mileage may vary here. I have no idea if this is helpful at all, but it's been helpful for me and some of my peers. So let's do this. OK, so the first rule of product design, as we think of it, is, is speed, fast, all these things. And when you think of fast, how many people think of le uh, latency? This is what I often think of. There's only one person that thinks of latency, so none of you are on the web, I guess. Um, but um, I think oftentimes of latency, like how do we make the servers faster? That's going to be helpful. But actually, I think there's a little bit different here. I think we need to figure out not just latency, but how do we allow the person that's using it, this consumer of whatever tool we're building, to get what they want faster? And I think of this about intent. Oftentimes, we forget what the user is actually trying to do. And we do what, what we, as a user, think we're trying to do. Um, my favorite experience of this, going back to e-commerce, is when you look at a shopping cart, like you add something to your cart, and then you basically continue to hit, I would like to buy this about 15 times. And it's like, why don't you just, why don't we just send it to them? Like, just, you, I, I want it, and then we send it. That's basically what my startup did. But this is something that you see, obviously we all know this, we can agree that we want, but still, we still build these same interfaces over and over again. Where in our tooling are we not, you know, following intent? 
That's the first one. Simplicity is the next one. So simplicity is pretty tricky. And the reason it's tricky is because it's just hard, I think. You look at Apple's products and they're like, these are very simple. And sometimes we mistake that for being featureless. But I actually have a different rule, which is don't be clever. Um, how many people here like to be clever? Okay, you guys will probably die soon. No one has ever survived clever, ever. Clever is the worst thing in the world. Clever is what happens when you're like, whenever an engineer walks up to me and says, I have a clever idea, I turn around and I run as fast as I can the other direction. It has never worked for anyone. And here's my example, and it doesn't have to do with engineering, but this is a good example. When your tax advisor comes to you and says, I have a clever idea, what do you say? <laughs> you all laugh because this is true. Anytime, now, now you, should take a, you should take a tally, you should have a special notepad, put a square on it. Every time someone says clever and it works, make a mark. No one will ever make any marks because it never works, ever. The thing about being clever is you're basically forgetting about the user. It's more emotionally or exciting or intellectually exciting to be clever than it is actually working or doing good things. And so I look at this and I think, oh, how can we solve this, this clever thing? Well, I think how you solve simplicity and, and, and anti-clever is you actually just think a lot about the user. When you think about that user and you invest in that simple user experience, you really start to see the difference between functional and usable. And often, as us, uh, us developer types, we can build functional until the cows come home. Is that a real thing, cows coming home? I think it is. But anyway, we can build functional until that happens. But it's very hard to build usable. So when I think about this stuff, I think, how do we build usable? That's the thing that's important. Um, next is personal. So personal is weird. And the only way I can really talk about this is the signal to noise ratio of our interfaces. And you think about these very busy interfaces that we use. Um, and another great example of this in commerce is, um, anyone here use Newegg? Great, great website, right? It's basically PHP MyAdmin with a shopping cart. <laughs> like this is basically just a database interface with a cart. And this is the problem. This is not a very personal interaction. And when you go there, you know, some of us are building computers, other of us are looking for headphones, and it has no idea who you are, even though they can probably look at our buying history for how it's been around forever, so for a very long time. So that's a good example of too much noise to not enough signal. But I actually have another uh, example that I really like, which is how many of, of y'all have bought ads on the internet? Anyone? Okay. Maybe I won't use that example, because only one person had bought, two people bought ads. So anyway, there's a good example. We'll talk about it later. The main thing here is you just want to let the user, that consumer of your product, find the things that they care about. And the interesting thing here is it might not be the things y'all care about. That's a challenge. This has been a challenge for me as I build things for myself, and sometimes I'm wrong. I know it's hard to believe, but yes, it's true. So one thing you can do here is you can start training the user. You can start training them through your interface to, to, to worry about the things that you worry about, to want the things that you want. This is really important. This is something we've learned. It's been hard, um, and it sometimes takes more time than just having that really inspirational interface, but it works pretty well. So the next one, though, is delightful. How many people here have heard of like delightful interfaces? Has, has you heard that? OK, a couple people from San Francisco. Who else? Um, this is one of my favorites because I really enjoy this idea of delightful interfaces, both because I aspire to build them and I love using them. Like these are the things when you use it and you're just like, yes, I love using this app. Um, that's very few things in the world, right, that you just love using, that you tell your friends. Like my, my poor partner, I'm always like, I love using this. And she's like, I don't care. I'm just like, no, you don't understand. I love using it. I remember when App Engine came out, I told her about it for like four hours and she was like, I, I'm asleep. Why are you talking to me? But um, here's this thing that I, that I like talking about. When you're thinking about delightful, I like thinking about serendipity. And serendipity is such this, this interesting thing. So how do we build that into our products, into our applications, into our design? How do we enhance that? And I think about it a lot like luck. And there's this really kind of silly equation for luck that we have. And I'm sure many of you have heard this before. But what if we place, replace luck with serendipity? Um, and then how do we do this in our interfaces to create opportunities for those users, for those consumers to fall into that place that we want them so they have this delightful time? And I have no idea what this means, um, but, I, but this is what's helped me. But my ne this next one is really important, um, repetition. And to, to, to talk about repetition, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask a friend to jump on the slides real quick. How many, how many of y'all know Kanye West? Okay, who here likes Kanye West? Okay, just like a handful. Did the rest of you must hate music uh, uh, or irrational ranting, one or the other, right? Um, so the thing about Kanye West is he makes great music. He's, he's you know, into hip-hop, all that stuff. But also,
also Kanye West says crazy things on the internet. First of all, he launched a startup that was Who Is. Do you remember that? He literally had a Who Is startup. This was beautiful. Like, who's, who's thought of that? That's a great idea. Um, maybe we can, the people that just quit their jobs, we can do that later. But here's the thing. Kanye West says crazy stuff all the time. But the other day, I was like cruising the internet, and someone was like, check out this crazy Kanye West interview. And I was like, click. And I read it, and I'm just like, wait a minute. This is not crazy. And I actually think Kanye West says a lot of smart things, which is the reason that I always click. Because he, he, he may come across as this kind of irrational character, um, especially on Twitter. But he doesn't, he always says these kind of nuggets. And one of the things he said is, innovation gets too much credit. And I don't know what it, whether he's talking about music or fashion or technology or what he was talking about, but this really resonated with me. Someone who often has, you know, I often am finding myself in roles where people are like, that was very innovative. And I was like, no, it wasn't innovative. We just did what we had to do. You know, we just did the thing that we needed to do. We weren't trying to innovate. Um, any innovation people here? OK, good. Anyway, um, so the next thing Kanye says, and this is like, you know, OK, there's no money in innovation. And you're just like, Kanye, keep talking. Go on. Like, what does this mean? And Kanye's like, the money is in repetition. And when you think about our projects, these fledgling projects we have, you know, on my GitHub, there's hundreds of these projects, just things that I start, the things that, go, that, that I'm really excited about. And when you think about this, you know, being innovative in those little, those little open source projects that any of us have, being innovative in any of the products that we're building for our companies, for our friends, being innovative doesn't matter. And this is where Kanye really drops some knowledge. The thing that matters is repetition. Unless we're able to get people to use this over and over again, unless we get people to commit, literally commit, unless we get people to interact with this over and over again, it really doesn't matter. So I look at product design, whether we're talking about open source products that we're building amongst ourselves or, or products that we're building at our giant companies that we may work for. Um, I look at this as how you have to test that over and over again. Um, you have to repeat it. And then therefore, we'll rep weaponize it. And then we'll make it happen. So that's it. Thanks. say this, Harper. Thank you all. What you all can't see is a timer here. Are, are, are you sure you're finished? I, have, right. I can answer some questions. Okay. I have a slide well, for it and everything. I was going to say, I, 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 look, man, this is too important. You're too good of a speaker to cut you off. So in no way do we mean to do that. Yeah, you actually have time left. So do you okay. Want to maybe do two questions? questions? Yeah, you okay. Have I have two questions. Let's make them good. Who has a question? Okay, in the back, right there. Yeah, you. Well, this is the thing about ad buying. Like, you guys buy ads. Like, the thing is, is I go, like, let's say I go look at a pair of shorts on the internet. Those shorts follow me, follow me around for, like, three weeks on bullshit ads, right? <laughs> well, here's the thing. When you go buy an ad, it's like they've never seen you before. You're like, I would like to buy a banner ad. And they're like, oh, what kind of banner ad would you like to buy? And you're just like, I bought 10 of them. What do you mean, what kind of banner ad? You follow, your shorts are showing up on your website, but you can't tell me what kind of ad I want to buy? And it's this idea of you're using all this data to create this product for us, but you're not using it internally to create a better experience for your, your core customers. And it's just a funny thing that happens. Yeah, those damn shorts, man. <laughs> OK, that, another question. Uh, oh, right there, yeah. Yeah, so the question is about expand and repetition. OK, how, how many people have really awesome open source projects that are in their GitHub and no one uses? Everyone's hand should probably be up. That's what I mean. We need more people to use these products, because that's how innovation spreads. We can all be innovative in our bedrooms and doing these cool things. Like I remember sitting, I had server racks, and I, my roommates were like, what are you doing in there? It sounds like a jet. And I was like, open source. But here's the thing, right? That's not what we need. We don't need each of us being individual contributors individually with ourselves. We need us to be individual contributors with a team of people that a bunch of people are using over and over again. That's how we great create these great products. And if you look at the products that are powering the internet right now, a lot of those were created because they were able to be repeat repeatable. They're able to be repeated <laughs> because of the repetition. And that's what I mean. It's, it's not that innovation, because I can, I can say, I can put up a, a GitHub repo up here, and I can say, this is very innovative. And we can all be like, that is very innovative. And then I'll go home, and no one will ever look at it, and it does not matter. There's no impact. No one ever uses it. No one sees it again. But when you go home, when I showed up on there, and I say, look, we have a boatload of contributors. Y'all are all using this. That's how things like Docker are invented. That's how things like Ansible are invented. That's how all these great things that we all use are invented. And that's what we need more of. 
Um, that's what I mean. Thank you, everyone. Um, <laughs>